So first off, I'd like to dedicate that song to my wife, who's not here, because I did that in the first service and she ran out of here. I'll tell you why in just a second. Uh, when you came in, you were handed a packet. In that packet is a card that you can take out and take notes because the message, because it comes from God's word, would be so profound this morning that it will change your life. Not because of anything I say, but because of what God says. So take some good notes. And then also there's a communication card in there. If um, something happens, I like to say for us people, sometimes it's better to be articulate when something occurs to us. We have a moment with God. And if you write a sentence or a few words on that card, you'll remember better. And then we'll get the card and we'll be praying with you about that. And also at the end of the service, you can come up to this corner and there'll be someone here that can pray with you if you have a prayer request. So the reason I dedicate that song to my wife, one, is because it's from the early 80s, which is the best decade ever, especially th those are my songs and some of your songs too. And I have so many great memories, but that song is a song by the Romantics. And that was the first song that Tina and I ever danced together to, to that song. And in that song, I don't know if we got to those words, but there's this spot where it says, and you really know how to dance. And while we were dancing, they were singing, and she was dancing, and I was like, uh-huh, she does. <laughs> Another check on the girlfriend list, she might be something. Uh, and things develop from there, and there's just like this word that I, that I use. It's really a sound. It's this, har. And that's kind of like what I know you don't want to know, but that's my word for her, especially when um, we get to dance, which just doesn't happen anymore. I tried to talk her into it on our anniversary yesterday, but she, we didn't have the, the right song. 34 years, 34th anniversary. 35 years later, my wife still got the moves. You know, she, still, she still got it for me. Uh, so we went out last night, but a week and a half ago, we took a cruise to celebrate our anniversary. We actually got back late or early Sunday morning, last Sunday. So when I did announcements last week, if I rambled and stuff, it's because we don't had a couple hours of sleep. We got in like two in the morning. We're all recovered from that. It was a great time. We had many great moments um, on that trip. Being, we went to Alaska and we got to see all the scenery. You just look out your window. Any moment is a great moment. But there was one moment that really stuck out for me. <clears throat> we went to Juneau. And I don't know if you know about Juneau, but there's only two ways to get to Juneau, by ship, and by plane, there's no roads that go to Juno. There's roads around Juno, but it's kind of remote. So we get there on the ship, and we're there in the morning, and we wanted, we like to experience the town, so we didn't take an excursion. So we were walking around downtown Juno, not that big. Things were just opening up, so you no know, shots were open. And we saw the Capitol building, and we kind of like Capitol buildings. We're kind of a little geeky that way. So hey, let's go look at the Capitol building. So we walk up to the Capitol building, we walk in, and there's a guy standing there, and he says, are you here for the tour? And I said, maybe? <laughs> and he said, no, oh, it's a free tour. It's behind the scenes, blah, blah, blah. He's one of those brainy historian guys. So we took this fantastic tour of the capital of Alaska. It was really cool. Didn't have to pay anything. So it was like our own excursion. And then we were walking through downtown Juneau. And if you know me, you know coffee's an important part of my life. And so there's coffee shops there. And so we stopped into a coffee shop. And because y'all, some of you wanted to know how we were doing, so we got onto Wi-Fi, Tina posted some pictures, we were just relaxing, having a good time in Juneau, and we were getting ready to leave. And as I'm walking past this guy, I look at him, and he looks familiar to me. And I've always had this thing in my head, I come from a very small community, it's like 56 people were in my graduating class. So every time I go to the airport, I think it would be so cool if I could run into someone from my community, a very small community of about a thousand people, two communities, a thousand each. Not, not likely, but, but there was this guy from my high school. I was pretty sure it was him. And I said, Tina, I said, I think I went to high school. I think that guy was my neighbor. And she goes, what? In Juno? You gotta say something. But I couldn't remember his name, but we're Facebook friends, but it just wasn't coming. And so I went up to him and said, hey, what's your name? And he said, Matt. I said, Matt Scranton? Because then I remembered his name. He said, yeah. And I said, it's Carlisle. Now, I'm going to tell you this. This is like a, a moment for us. You can't, if you call me this, I'll be mad at you. My name growing up was Carly. I became Carlisle when I became a man <laughs> later on. So he, so I said, Carly, Naylor. He goes, oh, I recognize you. So we had this little conversation. It was really cool. It was a cool moment. And then we followed up with a Facebook conversation. What were the, the odds of that? I mean, there were many little moments coming together. The question today is, everything happens for a reason. What was the reason 
for that? What was the reason for him? What was the reason for me? What was the reason for Tina? All these moments had to align for that moment to take place. What was the moment? Well, I have to tell you, this is where the, the story gets a little sad. It took me to actually a sad place. I've shared with you a little bit from time to time about my upbringing that it was kind of troubled. Well, and I, and I shared that we had a tragedy, have a tragedy in my family. My adopted father on January 1st of 1984 was killed in the front yard of my house, uh, the front yard of the house I was raised in while my neighbors watched it happen by my father's ex, um, his girlfriend's ex-husband. And I remembered that my friend lived across the street and that I had heard that he and his family had seen some of that happen. And it took me to a, a dark place, it took me to a sad place. You know how that can happen? When you have a moment and it takes you to a moment and you kind of get hijacked in the moment. I'm supposed to be on vacation. And there was this cool thing. I, I meet my a friend from high school and then it starts to get dark because I'm starting to remember. And I was thinking if things happen for a reason, I started thinking about what was the reason for that. I started thinking about my, my life and I started doing the little list. And I'm going to share some of the list with you. Some of the sad things and some of the happy things. And I was thinking if things, these things happen for a reason, I sure wasn't sure what the reason was when I was growing up. Like when I was 10 months old before I knew anything was happening, when my parents, my biological father and my mother decided that they couldn't get along anymore. And he left and they got divorced when I was 10 months old and I never got to meet him until his high school. What was, what was the reason for that? If everything happens for a reason, what was the reason for that? When my mother remarried when I was four and I got my nailer adopted name, but as I grew a little older and got into my teen years, I realized that that man, really, we just kind of tolerated each other. We never connected. What was the reason for that? When I tried out for the drum major of our high school, you know what the drum major is? The band director guy, marching guy. Uh, um, I was a sophomore. You're not supposed to be drum major unless you're a senior. Rules for me are just guidelines to know when you stepped outside of them. So I tried out and I got it. I became the drum major as a sophomore. What was the reason for that? When my mother's marriage to my adopted father ended my junior year, and when she got remarried my senior year, and I really wasn't fitting into her new life with five months left in high school, and then she kicked me out of the house. If everything happens for a reason, what was the reason for that? But then when my adopted dad kind of made up for the lack of interest that he had in my life, all my life encouraged me strongly to move in with him, to finish high school in a stable environment instead of trying to find a place to live with my friends until I went to college, what was the reason for that? And then a few months later when he died, what was the reason for that? And then a few months later when I wanted to escape from all of that, from all that chaos and all that was going on with the court case and all that stuff, and I moved to Idaho, and I met the love of my life that transformed my life. If everything happens for a reason, what was the reason for that? So if everything happens for a reason, what are all these reasons of these moments coming together in my life? Is it a cosmic thing? Is it this happenstantial thing that takes place for each of us in my life? I tried to balance out the list so y'all didn't get sad this morning. Some of them were good things. Some of them were bad things. It was about half and half if you were counting. Some of the things I did, some of the things other people did. If everything happens for a reason, what were all those reasons? Maybe you have your list. Maybe as I go through my list, you're starting to go through your list. And you're trying to stay positive as well. But there's things in your life that right now seem pretty pointless. Why did that happen? If everything happens for a reason, what was that reason? Some things happen to us and they're bad. Some things, like the tragedy that happened in my family, are actually evil. What's the reason that those things happen? So I don't think this is a good phrase, one that we should use. I think we can use it for like one to five events in our life on a one to 10 scale, on the one to five things like when your high school girlfriend or boyfriend breaks up with you or you get in a minor car accident, we could say, well, everything happens for a reason. And maybe that's kind of okay. But what about the six to 10 kinds of things? What about things like when Tina and I started our cruise, we heard on the news that on another cruise ship, 
a family was going on a cruise, and a grandfather was holding his granddaughter, his precious granddaughter, and he thought the window was closed and it was open and she fell to her death. What's the reason for that? And do you say, well, everything happens for a reason. What happens when you find out that your friend has cancer? Do you say something like that? I don't think so. What happens when you find out that your spouse is not sure if they want to be married to you anymore? I don't think we respond. So here's a quick lesson. Don't. Don't respond to those six to ten things with that because we don't know what the reasons are. We can't make sense of everything and sometimes things just don't seem to line up and this phrase doesn't do anything for us. So today we're going to take a look at it. We're going to take a look at a passage. But since I've cheered you all up, let's pray first. God, thank you that uh, more than a story you're writing, you're living a life with us. Thank you that um, you want to live that life even this morning through Jesus and through your word. So no matter what our list is, the goods and the bads, the things that make sense, the things that don't make sense, the good things, the bad things, the evil things, that you can take all those things. Help us to understand what it is that you're up to in our life and how you want to use all these things for the plan that you have for us. And it's your name we pray. Amen. So we're in a series where we're talking about things that we think that Jesus said or that sometimes the world thinks that Jesus says that he didn't really say. We're trying to get a better idea of what Jesus did say. So Jesus never said this, but when people start to think that they, um, uh, Jesus said this or that this phrase comes up, there's a story that's a good story that we can think about. It's in the book of John. It's the John's the fourth book of the New Testament, if you don't know where that is, and it's in the ninth chapter, and it's in the first three verses. That's all I'm going to read for you this morning. It's a story of a, a man who was born blind, and the disciples come upon this, and they ask Jesus some questions. This is what they said. As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So there's a main thought that I'd like you to um, write down and think about today that comes from this verse. And here it is. Cultivate a life posture of learning and trusting God. Whether you have a good list, uh, five points of good, Nine points of bad, no matter how big your list is, cultivate a life posture of learning and trusting God. Because I think, I believe that we get to decide whom or what we're going to learn from in our life and what we're going to be taught by. So we can cultivate a life posture of learning from God. There's a few interesting things I want to go over in this passage. Some, some key words, some key thoughts, and then as we get done with that, I'm going to leave you some things to apply to your life. So I think there's two quick assumptions that can help us get to this point of learning and trusting God. The first thing is the, um, the word that the disciples actually use first, that word rabbi. If you have your Bibles, you can circle it. I think it's an important word that we can look over. So here's what I think. I think that humans really think that things that don't have a good reason need a good reason. Do you agree with me? Things that, that don't, don't make sense to us, we want them to make sense. So the first thing that disciples said is they said rabbi. Do you know what rabbi means? It's a teacher. It's a teacher with knowledge and authority. So they see this thing that doesn't seem like there's a good reason. This, this, his, from birth, he was blind. That's not an optimum way to live. How did this happen? So the first word they say is rabbi, teacher. Teach us something about the situation that we can't make sense of. So that's how we should have the same posture, the life posture of when things come to us, good and bad and otherwise, that we see it as an opportunity to go to God, to go to Jesus and say, Rabbi, teacher, what can you teach me about this? Everyone wants to make reason, get reasons for what happens to them. I think even people who don't acknowledge God, people who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who aren't seeking to understand Jesus or to follow Jesus, people who don't believe in God, when they, have a, when they see a 6 to 10 occurrence, what's one of the first things that they say? How can a loving God allow this to happen? Even people who say they don't believe in God will say, how can a loving God allow this to happen? We all go there. So the posture that we can have 
is that we can learn from this. Don't you think that in the darkest times of life is when we're actually the most teachable? Don't you think that? In the darkest times of my life, in the first 19 years and just one or two since then, though that's when I learn the most. But I do think that we get to decide who or what we're taught by. We can decide. And it would be a great thing if we got this posture of rabbi, of Jesus, teach me what it is that has come into my life, what it is that you want me to learn about this. You're my teacher on life. The second thing that we see here that we struggle with as people is that we want justice to be served. We really think that justice needs to be served. What do the disciples assume about the situation? What do they ask? Who sinned? Who's responsible for this? They assume, like we can assume sometimes, that hardship equals punishment. There's a theology associated with that. It's called retribution theology. And in that theology, it means that we think that God is more about punishment than he is about love, than he is about forgiveness. Or when those two words coming together in church, we call that grace, that God is more about punishment than he is about grace. Well, I don't think that makes sense. There's a couple of reasons. One is a human reason and one's a God reason. The human reason is this. We all know people, you're not one of them, I'm sure, that have got away with things that were bad or maybe even evil and they're doing okay. So this isn't true. It doesn't serve them right. So that's the first thing. The math doesn't work out because sometimes people get away with stuff. But there's a bigger one for people who contemplate God that we think that if God's punishment, it's going against God's very nature. I read an article last night at 9 p.m. that said followers of Jesus, Christians with quotation marks and everything, one in three of us in this room, one out of three believe that God is good to us when we do right and good things. Not because he loves us and has a wonderful plan for us. One in three of us think that just like hardship equals punishment, obedience equals blessing. One in three of us believe in that. That's not consistent with God's nature. God loves us. Regardless of the things we do, he still loves us. And he wants to offer us forgiveness. He wants us to overcome those things that have overcome us. And the way we overcome it is through a relationship with Jesus. He took care of that for us. It's against God's nature, this retribution theology thing. So Jesus tried to, tries to counter all that. And he says, the reason was not sin at all. The reason was so that people could come to know who God actually is, to come to know him in a deeper and more meaningful way. Did you catch what he said? He said so that the works of God can be displayed. If you're into circling your words, circle works and circle displayed. Those are important words. The word for works means toil and effort, that God is toiling and efforting not casting a magic wand or snapping his finger, that God is at work. It's like orchestration, it's strategy, it's logistics coming together. It's not happenstance, it's not just moments coming together. It's a God who loves you, who's full of grace, who's working things out in your life. He was up to things in the life of that blind man blind from birth. He was up to things in the parents of that man. He was up to things in the disciples. And he's up to things in your life too, even today, no matter how big or bad your list is. The second word that's important is that word display. That word means to see something new, to see something new, to see something in a way that it hasn't been displayed yet. So our, G our rabbi Jesus who wants to teach us things, even the, the six to ten things that happen to our life, he wants to teach us things, wants to see something, wants us to see something new about him, about us, about our world. He's always ready to teach us something. But the thing about that, that we have to come to terms with is it could take some time as we look to Jesus to be our rabbi, to make sense of our life. Some things will get revealed. In a short time, some things won't get revealed. There's still things that we all wonder about. For me, I told you that the, I got a quick turnaround when I left my state that I grew up in and moved to Idaho to get away from that. I met Tina, my wife, within a few months, and it really did. Partly because of her and partly because of God, it changed the trajectory of my very life. It really did. I was doing things myself that were headed in the wrong direction, but because things had happened, God grabbed it. That was a quick turnaround, but sometimes it takes a little longer. So we're going to get to that in a little bit too, to be patient with God. So 
how can we apply this to our life? We need to, to cultivate a life posture of learning and trusting God. Here's a question. When things happen to us, ask yourself, who did it? Was it God? Was it me? Or was it someone else? So the quick answer to the question, do things happen, everything happens for a reason? Yes, it's actually true. I believe that it's true. I think we just have to decide who did, did it, who brought it about. Did God bring it about? Because some things God does bring about. Did I do it? On my list, there were some things I did. There's a whole lot that I did wrong that we'll, we'll get to eventually as I confess my sins to you about how God transformed that. Some things I did. Some things people did to me. So things do happen for a reason. It's not just because of cosmic moments coming together. It's because we have free will. We're people who do stuff. Some of the stuff aligns with God and some of the stuff doesn't align from God. And sometimes we cast things into motion ourselves and sometimes we get caught up in other people's stuff. But sometimes God does stuff that he wants us to be affected by. So first thing is we need to learn to give credit where credit is due. We've got to decide who did it and give them credit for doing it. I think that we are too quick as people to give God credit for things that people do. I think we do it all the time. We did that. God didn't do that. That was something I did, or that was something something else did. Now, God can do something with it, but we need to give credit where credit is due. But we can also see from this passage that there are times when God does do some stuff that we don't enjoy. There, God does some stuff that we don't agree with, and those times are tough, aren't they? Some of us are going through them right now, but we still have to learn to develop a trust of God that loves us and that is working things out on our behalf. And sometimes it can take a long time. Sometimes it can be a quick turnaround time, like I said, but sometimes we will not have sufficient answers in a few months. Sometimes we will not have sufficient answers in a few years. Sometimes we won't have sufficient answers in our lifetime. But I'm not God, and you're not God. If God is up, up to work, is he, if he's toiling on our behalf because he has this big plan that he's orchestrating, He's working the plan. I do believe, and hopefully you do too, that someday those things that don't work out in my life or that I don't understand and see the reason for, I will know the reason. And I will step back and go, oh, so that thing that I did, you were working that out to protect me from myself. Wow, thank you, God, for doing that. Or that this thing over here that I thought was so bad, and it was bad, and I had a hard time with it, but you've done this and this and this, and these people were affected by it. I think we're going to get glimpses of that, and we'll see that God really is up to something right now in our life. We just have to hold out hope with, and trust God and believe that he is who he says he is and that he's doing these things. There's three more things that I want you to remember as, we go, as you learn to trust God in the six to ten things particularly. The first thing is remember that this thing is really between God and me. So even if this thing is done by someone else, if this thing is done by me, and if this thing is done by God and we put it in a 6 to 10 category, it's really an opportunity for us to go to God because he is working on our behalf. He is toiling on our behalf. He is orchestrating on our behalf. He is strategizing for you. And he wants us to trust him and believe that he is who he says he is and then even anticipate that he's working these things out in our life, even the six to ten things that to us don't seem to have a good reason for happening. So this thing is between God and me. It's an opportunity for this relationship to go to a new spot. The second one is to discover the new thing, the rabbi thing. I think that's, that's a cool thing that I'm going to grab onto is that on, a, on this thing that's coming to my life, this is like a rabbi moment, Jesus? Is this, is this one of those rabbi moments where you want me to go to you and, and learn something from you, something that I haven't seen before, something new to me, something revealed to me that I haven't seen before? Help me to learn what it is you want me to learn. So here's a weird analogy. I, I drive a blue Honda Element. Uh, it really fits my lifestyle, mountain biking, all that stuff. I picked it on purpose. I picked it a few years ago. I had some criteria. I wanted a 2006 Honda Element. Uh, I picked that year because of the way the car looked. And I decided that I wanted it to be blue because I hadn't seen blue Honda Elements before. And I don't know if you can tell. I like to be a little different sometimes. So I wanted a blue Honda Element. So we found a blue Honda Element 
in another state, and so we through this car dealer, and they had it shipped here, and so I got my blue Honda Element. I'm still driving it. So what happened right after I got my blue Honda Element? You know what happened? What did I start to see? I know I'm a trendsetter. I started to see everyone was buying blue Honda Elements right after I bought mine. No. They were older than mine. They bought Blue Honda Elements even the same year before I did because I had eyes for what I didn't have eyes for before. Make sense? So with this discovering a new thing, wouldn't it be so cool if rather than getting down about the things that happen to us, even if they're something that we don't agree with, that we go to Jesus and say, hey, I want to have like Blue Honda eyes like Carlisle had. I want to develop a habit in my life, this habit where I look for you to teach me something that I've never seen before. And that can help us get through those times. The last thing that we need to remember is this thing is good because, to try to put that positive spin, if it's at least allowed from God and God wants to teach me something and Jesus is my rabbi, why is this good? This is good because I can maybe be a little stronger than I was before this happened to me. This is good because maybe I'm going to know some stuff that I didn't know before. I'm going to be a little smarter than I was before. Maybe this is good because I'm going to be a little braver. I'm going to be able to withstand things like this. Or maybe this. Maybe this is good because I'm going to have empathy for people who go through something like this, and I can be of service to them because I'm getting through it myself. The alternative to this, this is bad because. And we, we can do that. We probably do it too often. And what happens? We say, this is bad, and now I trust a little less. I trust God a little less. I trust my spouse a little less. I trust my kids or my friends or my boss a little less. Not a good way to be living through that moment. This is bad because now I get to be a little more bitter. I, need to, I get to be a little more cynical. Is that a goal that we have in life? It's not. Um, This is bad, so now I get to be a little more isolated. I get to hedge myself off from people and not have any good friends or relationships. That's not a good way that we want to live either. So those are three things we can remember. I have a story I want to tell you. I already shared my story. There's too much of me already in this. I just want to say this about my story. The thing that made the difference for me is Jesus and Tina. And not just because things were done to me, because I was doing things too. God took a messed up life, mine, and changed it. So things can happen for a reason if I go to God to discover what that reason is. I wanted to share one more story with you. I'm gonna re- I saw a post, I'm going to read it to you in just a second, from a friend of Journey. It's a guy who's actually been here twice. He's spoken to us. His name's Scott Rigsby. When he was a young man, he was coming home from work. And he was crossing that bridge right there. And he was on the back of a flatbed trailer and a diesel passed. And it got too narrow. And there was an accident. And his legs got crushed. And over the next couple of years, both of his legs ended up getting amputated. They didn't amputate him then. They tried to save them. It was this long ordeal. And so he um, posted a post the other day that I want to read to you. This is what it says. 33 years ago today, July 23rd, 1986, on this bridge, I had a catastrophic accident that would eventually lay claim to both of my lower legs while leaving me to survive and struggle with the very devastating effects of a traumatic brain injury. Overcoming my traumatic brain injury and its ongoing effects have been my greatest accomplishment to date. But my legs still make the most glaring and lasting impact on the general public upon first sight. One of the most commonly asked questions I get as I travel around the country speaking is, would you, if given the chance, ever want your real legs back? If there was a magic wand to wave and instantly return your birth legs, would you give them back? Would you want them back? Or would you make the choice to keep living with prosthetics? My answer to that question is easy, but the journey to the answer was not. I would want to keep my prosthetic legs and live the rest of my life with them because I know that I can make a bigger difference and a more profound impact in the world and change more lives than if I had my birth legs miraculously given back to me. I know that decision may confuse those that struggle to find comfort in their own skin, and my heart goes out to them with great compassion. But my body doesn't define the kind of person that I am, and neither do my legs, whether they are made of shiny metal or smooth, blemish-free, tanned skin. The truth is, 
I have my real legs now. These shiny metal sticks, which I balance upon every day, have taken me farther and allowed me to reach higher than my birth legs ever could. These legs are a blessing. They are a gift to share and not a burden to bear. That's the kind of guy that I want to be. I want to be the kind of guy that has a six to 10 event like that and that I can be patient and I can trust a loving God who's working out a good and strategic plan for me and people around me. That's who I want to be. That's how I'm praying we will be. May it be said of us. May that be so of us. Would you pray with me? God, thank you that no matter what's happened in our lives, that you knew that um, you're working things out, that you're toiling on our behalf. Help us to trust you and to believe you about that. I know there's people in here that are dealing with things today that they have to go and deal with. Give them some peace. Help them to trust you with what's going on. Uh, help us to make it through the weeks and the years. Thank you for this story from Scott. And help us to trust him the way that he trusts you, that there's a bigger story going on. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our rabbi now, today. Help us to seek you out no matter what the situation is. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.